Hello, everybody. I'm Bob Couture, host of Where the Twain Meet. Welcome to our series of chats and interviews that I hope will shed new light on the subject of dispute resolution, areas where our human competitive and cooperative impulses, the core elements of conflict, are melded together into alloys of behavior that may not always prove predictable. We'll look in places where you'd expect the subject to be examined, but also perhaps where you might not. Our agreements, truces, deals, legal judgments, alliances, bonds of love, victories, losses, even works of art created by some magical alchemy? Or are there real axioms, proven methods, which guide us through the churn of conflict to meaningful resolution. I think about Rodney King's simple plea during the 1992 Los Angeles protest riots. Can we all get along? Can we all get along? That wasn't just a question. It was a proposition too. Is that proposition impossible to achieve or even ridiculous to seriously consider? Let's talk with folks who may tell us something that we don't know, and let's try to find more answers. Of course, like many good things in life, some of the remedies are probably in plain sight. But on this show, we'll do our best to probe ideas simple and complex and not look the other way. Moira Caruso is a strategy officer within the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Office of National Projects. Her primary focus is the mediation and facilitation of large-scale public policy negotiations. In addition, Moira works with mediators across the country to help them design and deliver specialized conflict management processes on behalf of FMCS clients. Prior to serving as a strategy officer, Moira's New England mediation practice covered multiple sectors and industries private, nonprofit, public, and federal, including healthcare, higher education, public education, and service industries. I met her through my work as a collective bargaining negotiator in Boston when she mediated a negotiation in which I was involved. Moira has much to say about the process of dispute resolution, the dynamics of trust and fairness, the impact of emotions and pressurized decision-making in arenas of competing interests. I'm pleased to introduce her to you and hope you enjoy our discussion today about where the twain meet. Welcome to the show, Moira. It's so good to see you. It's been a while since we worked together, but I know that you've been quite busy working at FMCS, and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. It's great to be here, Bob. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really excited that you're doing this. So tell me about the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service and its role in resolving labor disputes. FMCS is a really small and completely independent federal government agency. We fall under the executive branch. And we were created in 1947 as part of the Taft-Hartley Amendment to the National Labor Relations Act. We exist to promote sound and stable labor relations, assistance with collective bargaining, training in relation to collective bargaining and positive relations, and really to advocate for collective bargaining in general. That's why we were created. Ever since that time, ever since the late 40s, our mission has slowly and incrementally expanded. Through service reform, we were able to provide mediation for federal government agencies and their workers. The Administrative Dispute Resolution Act really widened the scope of services that we could provide and who we could provide them to, to the point where, you know, we can really get involved in almost any type of dispute. In terms of the services that we provide, we provide mediation, obviously, and really anything that goes along with supporting. So when is it time to call the mediator? Who makes the decision to enter mediation? There's a lot there. There's a lot to timing. We say it's a good time to call us when progress has stalled or come to a halt, but there is still some room for movement. We're not magicians. If there absolutely is no room for movement, then, then mediation might not be appropriate. 
but you could also be surprised as to where and when you could find that area for movement. So applying some creativity to the situation is something that we pride ourselves on. Um, you can potentially call a meter in too early if, for instance, progress has come to a halt, but that has something to do with other than the fact that there's no room for movement. Maybe the parties really aren't ready, but it's generally a good idea to give us a call when you're struggling um, finding movement. So when you talk about the readiness of parties in the negotiation process, perhaps for mediation, what is the dynamic prior to mediation that you think is beneficially addressed in the normal negotiation process? You wouldn't ask a mediator to sit there with you at the start of negotiations necessarily, would you? No. In an ideal environment, no. Sometimes we're called in, frankly, and it maybe is a little bit early. And we will tell you because we don't like to waste anyone's time, yours, ours, and there's not an opportunity to create value. We will tell you. We'll say, call us if you get hung up. It might be because there's absolutely no movement and it's really early on, which is kind of a sign that there's a little bit more work to do before you really need mediation. Or maybe you just thought it was a good idea to have us there and you genuinely don't need mediation yet because you are making progress. Maybe it isn't happening as quickly as you like. But I'm not sure that that's getting to your question of what's happening calling in a mediator. That moment where either party suggests that some external assistance could be helpful. That's a recognition that is sometimes hard. Not everyone is comfortable at the outset of inviting an insider into your negotiations, coming off the street knowing nothing. Sometimes that can be a really helpful thing for somebody to, to not know anything coming in cold. That can be difficult for some folks. What are the benefits of mediation over arbitration, for instance? The first thing I talk about when I get asked that question is really making sure we understand the differences between mediation and arbitration. Usually when I outline the differences, folks have their answer as to which one is more appropriate for their purposes. Both processes involve a third party neutral. So there's a similarity. In mediation, the mediator will come in and work to bring the parties together. Always the parties will retain complete control of the outcome. So the mediator has no authority to compel either or both parties, no enforcement authority. Now you go over to arbitration and you have the third party neutral coming in, hearing both parties' arguments, essentially, and then rendering a decision that is binding on both of those parties. So you might think, okay, so that's not cool because we lose control of the outcome. In mediation, there are no guarantees. You might not get to a place where both parties agree on what the outcome will be. They might need to be told. And so if that's the case, if you're not going to come to agreement, then you need closure somehow. So that might be a reason for you to call in an arbitrator versus a mediator is if you really do need someone else to tell the parties to render a decision that is binding and provides closure. So you also perform facilitation in large-scale public policy negotiations. How does that process differ from labor negotiations? Most of my work now is involved in regulatory negotiations. So Congress passes a law and that's not the end. That's just the beginning. We need regulation to tell us how to comply with the law, to tell government agencies how to administer the law or whatever programs or services that that law creates. So there needs to be regulation, you know, the how, the what, the when, the where, the why. And so I facilitate a multi-party negotiation to write the regulation. And what that looks like is the cognizant government agency that's responsible for the rule would invite negotiators who are representative of stakeholder groups to come in and reach a consensus rule. So the primary difference there is that whereas labor negotiations 
usually involves two parties. Regulatory negotiations often will have like 26 or 28 parties, you know, close to 30. And you have a lot of varying different interests at stake. And we use a collaborative process normally to start from scratch and create regulation to implement the rule. So a lot of times the subject matter also feels quite different because we're really not talking about workplace matters, usually, unless it's a rule around those. But a lot of times we're talking about something like, you know, tailpipe emissions or um, light bulb standards, Native American Indian tribes, tribal self-governance, things of that nature. So the issues also look quite a bit differently than they do in labor management. So in some ways, that process is more complex. It is quite complex. Now, you know, that's not to say that there's not a fair amount of complexity at the negotiating table in collective bargaining, but the nuances do feel quite a bit greater in that sphere with so many moving pieces. Agreement is just one thing. Then you have to tell the public about it. And different agencies have to work with one another because there's oversight and notice periods and all of those things that need to get sorted out before a rule can be published. And our role actually expands because it actually borders on program management to help agencies and parties navigate all of that. There's a lot going on there. The process of mediation is sometimes described as assisted negotiation. Does that ring true to you? It definitely does, Bob. While I think that's a good thing, it also sometimes can get people's back up. I think I was trying to allude to this in an earlier question, but you know, imagine having someone come in and it's like, well, wait a minute, I can't do this myself. Is there a problem with my negotiation style? Am I not persuasive enough? Can we really not get it done? And the answer is people can and they do every single day. You heard me say earlier, there's only about 125 of us in the United States and there are a lot more collective bargaining mediations that take place in the course of a year than we could ever get to. It does feel like assisted negotiations, but it's not as if we're doing anything that anyone else can't do. What are important attributes of a good mediator? You have to be able to listen. Listening is hard work. And it's one thing to say, oh, I'm, I'm a good listener, but when I talk to people about how to listen and how I listen, you want to finish the sentence. What are you listening for? So if you're showing up listening for opportunities, listening for something to build on, you're listening to one party for something that the other party can not necessarily agree to whole scale, but there's something in there that can be built upon, or there is some sort of signal or message that there might be room for movement or there might be something that could be tailored about a proposal or an option to be a little bit more suitable. Agreement is something that you build. That's how I look at it. It's not what's left after everyone's done ripping each other apart. <laughs> it's something that you build incrementally with each exchange. And listening I think is the most important thing to not just getting agreement, but getting agreement and preserving or even improving upon the relationship. Patience is the other one, because sometimes this takes a lot of time and a lot of difficult personalities and difficult people. And patience is really important. Also, I mean, this isn't a quality or a trait, but impartiality is something that you spend your career kind of honing and getting right. Creativity. I didn't say creativity. That's really important. Speaking about difficult parties and importance of being impartial, you must find sometimes that you don't like certain parties particularly well, or they're a challenge, if it's true. You know I like everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just was checking. <laughs> That's... <laughs> Some of us have to struggle more with that. You're not going to get me on a microphone saying I don't like people, but some people and personalities prove a lot more challenging than others. And I get frustrated just like anyone else does. There's a saying, we're neutral, we're not neutered. There's a term I heard a researcher use 
we talk about unconditional love, love that isn't dependent on anything, the day of the week, how the person behaves, what they believe, right? So the term is unconditional welcome. You don't have to like someone to be able to work with them. You just have to show them some grace. You don't even have to be tolerant. But if you show everyone the same kind of welcome as if they deserve to be there because they do, it's kind of this magic thing that helps you see them in a different light. So you think about the most extreme types of folks and things that they do that really bug you. Anti-vaxxers, that's not the most extreme, but a lot of folks have a hard time believing that someone could be against a vaccine that could greatly improve public health. If you could see them in a way that allows for the reality that something's happened in their life to where they just don't feel like they can trust the government, and it's probably perfectly valid, then it really helps in terms of how you have to work with that person. And in collective bargaining, we don't really get a divorce. You have to work with them. Sometimes mediators talk about transformative outcomes. Is that something that's on your mind? Do you aspire to it? You have to let go of the outcome if you're going to be effective. And I can look back on transformative relationships that have surprised me. I don't think we would have gotten there if that was what we were going for. Transformation is absolutely possible, but if you're too focused on it and you miss the building blocks and the basics, then you're going to blow past all of that and blow your shot at it. So it's something that I think about and I think about more in the rearview mirror. And in the moment on little things like if that was framed a little bit differently when we come back in joint session, then it's likely to maybe build a little bit of a bridge. And it's those small incremental things that throughout the course of a project. I think you used the term aspiration earlier. Aspiring is one thing, but where you place your focus on the day-to-day -day is another thing entirely. But I like to think that transformation is more often than not very possible. Those building blocks that you referred to is part of building an agreement. How much are those involved in competing on issues as opposed to collaborating? There's a lot there. If I'm dissecting it in my mind when I think about how parties begin, oftentimes on gaining something or, more importantly, not giving something up. And if we can get some incremental movement early on to create a little bit of momentum, there's a point where the emphasis shifts a little bit, ever so slightly, but it matters. Winning and losing, gaining, you know, to working together towards some common goal. I can speak for myself. I'm hyper-focused in the beginning on those little wins or ways that parties show up and be what they're saying and what they're putting forward is putting them in a little bit more positive light. Even just the way a proposal is presented can start to do that. Pointing to the areas in that proposal that were responsive to what you heard from the other party in the last joint session is the smallest thing that you can imagine. And you might think that it's obvious, but articulating it at the outset of your presentation can have all the difference in how that next exchange goes. And that's seemingly a little thing, but it's not nothing to me. So the manner in which people communicate counts for something. Definitely. It's not just the selection of words. It's ordering of things. And it's what you include and what you don't include. A common misconception that I hear early on is that we should avoid telling the other party that XYZ just isn't going to work for us because that means we're not bargaining in good faith, okay? Not being honest when you are having a hard time with someone's proposal and not outlining what is problematic with that, that presents its own set of problems. 
that could be labeled as dishonesty or proceeding in bad faith and then giving us the bad news at the last minute when there's nothing that we can do about it. So th that's all part of communication. It's not just the words that we choose and the perfect phraseology or, or so to speak. There are a million different choices and decisions that you can make when you're working with someone. So that's part of how you facilitate productive dialogue. In spite of the fact that labor disputes can involve highly emotional situations. What are your thoughts about the emotions of each side and how you handle that? This deserves its own episode. <laughs> Understanding emotion, working with emotion, accepting that we are emotional human beings before we're anything else, I think is really important. It's interesting to me that I get asked about emotion almost everywhere I go. And I think that's because something is triggered in us when we're bargaining. Something to our core that has to do with survival and our ability to provide for ourselves and our loved ones. To act like that doesn't exist isn't going to work for us. And that's, in fact, I think where we see a lot of things bubble up and then blow up at the table. When I see someone suppressing it and kind of blowing up in the room, I encourage them to find a way to articulate how upset they are in words that the other party will hear. I think that's the most effective way to deal with it. Not to hide the fact that you're getting upset is really calling it out. I am upset and we have to work through this if we're going to make progress anywhere. And sometimes, in fact, that's something that a mediator can do. If someone who is extremely emotional and upset is not hearing anything, that's something that I can work with in the other party's room. And I don't have to focus on emotion at all. I can focus on the outcomes or lack of outcomes that we are seeing and honestly ask the party if there's something that they can adjust to maybe have their message or their proposal be a little bit better heard and understood so that we can get back to talking business. What kinds of behavior cross a red line for you at the table? <laughs> Hardly anything. Because it's more often the case that one party will take me aside and say, how could you let that happen? How could you let them say that to me? That's when I will remind them what my job really is. It's not to settle people down. I mean, it's, sometimes it's to settle people down not to prevent emotion from being expressed. Let me put it that way. Sometimes, frankly, a blow up has to happen so we can get past it and move on. That's another part of it. I can count on one hand the amount of times that I have had to nearly stop a mediation because someone's behavior was so bad. The only real red line is if violence ensues. That's, of course, not appropriate. There is colorful language. That happens quite a bit. And that's just an expression of emotion. If someone's not listening to me, I'm going to make my point, you know. But it has to be pretty extreme to really cross a line. I think extreme behavior is information that we can act on. One important part of your job or in your decision making would be what to handle in caucus and what to handle in the room with all parties at the table. How do you approach that? And are there formulas that you use? You never hear me chastise one party or the other when they're together. Okay, so that's not going to happen in joint session. If there's something that I have to address about delivery or behavior or whatever, that will happen in private caucus. As you know, and, and probably as most of your listeners know, anything that a party shares with me in private caucus is completely secret and I'm not at liberty to share any of that. So if something happens in joint session where I feel a piece of information would be useful if it were shared, I will still separate the parties and I will check in with the information in question. More often than not, I will suggest they share it and I'll tell them why and how I think it could be useful. So it's more often the case that I would encourage another party to share information that I receive in confidence. Sometimes, and this one is kind of a delicate example, but if I have an idea, we do get them from time to time. 
something that I think could be helpful for the parties to consider. There are situations where that idea might spur an expectation for one party or the other because the mediator is suggesting it, it must be a good idea. And if it's something that might cause one or the other party some concern, I would float that idea in private. It seems to me that mediators, negotiators, as individuals need to find their voice. We're not all the same. Do you find yourself talking differently with a management group or the labor group? Is your lingo different? Do you adjust how you speak to the group or do you find that you will stay in a certain lane in the way you address parties? I'd be curious across the board at how different mediators would answer this question. I absolutely adjust. It's not dependent on labor and management. It's to the individuals because we all look different. We all sound different. We all come from different backgrounds. It is almost always the case that I will know a little bit about you shortly after we're working together because that's just how we talk about where we come from and our backgrounds. And I definitely find myself, based on anything, since where you grew up, what kind of background, white collar, blue collar, I'll say it. I do. I try to get on your level, whether that's up, down, left, right, back, forth. I'm trying to get on your level. Do you find that haste in negotiations matters? And do you ever attempt to influence how quickly the process unfolds? And I think attached to that question, I probably should ask, I know that the essence of mediation is facilitative, but I'm imagining sometimes you could be more directive. How do you handle those decisions? So there's a few questions in there. I'll take the last one first because it actually reminds me of a similar answer to the one I just gave where I'm, you know, I'm trying to get on your level. I'm also trying to meet you where you are and provide the level of intervention and the level of directiveness that I think the time and the situation calls for. There are multiple variables that influence whether I dial it up or down. So there are certain sets of parties where we've been together for several bargaining cycles. We know each other well, and I know that they need and want a more directive mediator facilitator. And if I'm not speaking straight, guiding them a little bit tighter on process, so to speak, then they're not going to be happy and we're not going to be getting an agreement as quickly. If you go too fast or if you're too directive with the wrong circumstance, it's going to be damaging, to be frank. And... That would be fine as long as the parties are productive without you. And maybe that's the case, too. Maybe they just needed you to come in and shake some things up. But you kind of have to read them to intuit. We didn't talk about intuition earlier when you were talking about things that a mediator needs. I think everybody, every human is incredibly intuitive. It takes work to understand your own intuition, to learn your own intuitive language. And... That is really important to me when I'm working with a group is to feel them out and to sense. For me, it's, it's kind of a sense as to what they need in terms of level of direction. If you encourage parties, it can be pretty risky for a mediator to move faster than they're ready for. Because if they make a mistake, if they come to a tentative agreement or something that they have to then reopen or back out of, that's damaging, potentially. So you have to be really careful you're making progress. Taking the time to check in with parties and making sure they understand. Now, comfort is a different thing. Making sure they're comfortable, that's kind of subjective. That's tricky because you can talk yourself out of an agreement very easily. So we walk a fine line there. But making sure that parties understand what it is they're agreeing to is kind of our barometer. That's what we want to make sure we're getting right. That influences timing. If you were to weigh that territory you get into when you're being directive, the places where you're most vulnerable, would you say it can violate that sense of impartiality that you need to project to parties? So in other words, directive behavior could be equated with 
a lack of impartiality. It could. You've got to make sure you are treating both parties similarly. And I don't mean same and I don't mean fair. I mean equitable. But I'm dialing it into the same level, roughly, with both parties. And honestly, if I think about the times when I am more directive, it is with the parties together. Because then they're all hearing me say the same thing. And it's not directed to just one or the other. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a private caucus and I've had to say, listen, I'm doing the same thing in the other room that I'm doing in this room. So just keep that in mind. That's really my job. Conceivably, you can take that too far. That's the fine line. There's this saying that we use a lot. Your mediator cannot want the agreement more than you do. A lot of people ask me, how do you get evaluated? How does a mediator know if they're being successful? Like, if we get a deal here, do you get a bonus or do you need a certain number of agreements to be a good mediator or whatever? Well, when the director of the agency hired me, I asked him that question. I said, how do you know that a mediator is a good mediator? And he said, they're working. So if I'm being called into rooms to help, that means that I am an effective mediator. It's not your agreement. You're going to get there regardless. But that's the point at which you can't be more directive. We are in service to the agreement and to the parties. But if we are getting so directive that it feels like we want it more than they do, that's where you've got to dial it down. I know I've asked this question in another way already, but are there times when zero-sum distributive bargaining is a necessary part of productive negotiations? There's a misperception that mediators walk around telling people they have to engage in collaborative bargaining if they need to engage in good productive bargaining. And that's not the case. There are situations where there simply is a pie. <laughs> Short of having a bake sale and finding more money, you know, there are times when there's the money that you have and that has to be distributed. So you hear me talking a lot about money and, and referring to money. Money is the quintessential distributive topic. You can certainly generate more money under certain circumstances, but usually we have a purse and that has a fixed amount of money in it, whether that goes to salary, whether that goes to benefits, whether that goes to something, um, but it does have to go somewhere. And so that's a good example of, of something that is almost purely distributive. Am I reading your question right that you're kind of talking about collaborative bargaining versus positional bargaining as well? Yeah, I also am interested in the relationship between integrative bargaining and distributive bargaining. I would think the mediator has a way of bringing more integrative process to the negotiation. Sure. I think you could start even broader. We bring process, period. And then where that can be more integrative, that's fantastic. Transformational, great. And hopefully, to harken back to an earlier answer, hopefully you are building something together, building a stronger relationship, building more trust to when it does need to get distributive, your back doesn't get up quite as quickly or... Maybe it does get up, but that's not insurmountable. And so you've laid a foundation to engage more productively when things turn more distributive. So you're in negotiations, you're in mediations, and one party strikes or the other party locks out. How does that change things at the table? Is it ever helpful? Is it a different game? Yeah. It definitely changes things. This is all dependent on the situation, you understand. But I would say, on one hand, you've kind of blown that leverage. So the cat's out of the bag, the genie's out of the bottle, you can't unring the bell. You've gone out or you've locked him out. Now you no longer have that threat. I mean, unless you're going to do it again, of course. But you've done it, you've now survived it, and now you're back at the table. One party can now say, well, big whoop, we made it through that. So what are you going to hang over my head now? Sometimes the threat of a strike or the threat of a lockout is more extreme than the thing itself. The opposite also can be true. My mentor's words are kind of ringing in my head. You will always, no matter who you are, both parties will always underestimate how far the other party is willing to go to damage you if you go nuclear, right? And I've seen it oh, almost irreparably and irreparably damage 
relationships to where you can't get it back. It can have devastating consequences. Plants close. People lose jobs permanently. The effects are genuinely heartbreaking. And the world looks differently. All of a sudden, you don't have the verve that you once did to get an agreement. So it changes everything in short. I've also been involved after a strike when you have to come back. It is darn near impossible to eke out something that everyone can feel good about. You just have to pick up the pieces and move on and deal with the fallout and then come back in the next round of bargaining. In the interim, there's some work to be done. Not just pick up the pieces, but address the problems that led to the strike and the fallout and try to put it back together to the extent that everyone can move on and engage productively. I've heard the phrase about negotiations, trust is the coin of the realm. How important is trust in the negotiation process? Not as important as everyone makes it out to be, in my opinion. I walk into a lot of rooms, and when my foot crosses the threshold, hardly anyone trusts me or each other, to be quite frank. But we can still work together. I don't need your trust day one. I just need your cooperation. So I kind of exchange trust for cooperation as we go along. I think trust is a really important thing that someone, given the givens, would choose the option that is not going to disadvantage you or harm you or your constituency. But we are people. And if I have option A that's better for me and option B that's better for you, I'm probably going to select option A. And you might think, that you can't trust me because of that, but I'm acting in my own self-interest. Hopefully we can create an option together that is good for everybody, but trust is a tricky thing. I mean, you know, have you ever lied? I thought I was the interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> when people get hung up on trust, I ask them that question. And I don't think anyone can say no to that question. I think we've all lied. But my immediate next question is, Okay, well, so why should I trust you? And that causes you to think for a second. What do we mean when we say trust? What trust to me means telling them what you're going to do, what you say you're going to do. And in those instances where you can't or didn't do what you say you were going to do, you own it, and then you take measures to make it right. I don't think you can ask much more for people who are coming together in a traditional bargaining sense where sometimes better for me means not as good for you. As a mediator, you are focused on fair process. How do you manage your inner thoughts about fair outcomes? And I know we've talked about both a little bit, particularly the outcomes, but what's going on inside? First of all, I kind of have to move away a little bit from the word fair to equitable. <laughs> I like the word equitable because you can meet that standard a little bit easier. But because fair can get a little bit subjective, I just have to make sure that if I am saying something to one party, I at least can envision myself saying that exact same thing to the other party. Maybe it's delivered a little bit differently depending on who I'm talking to, like we alluded to earlier. But if I wouldn't be comfortable going there with one party, I'm probably not going to go there with another party. That's my gut check. And when I think process, my question becomes, is this process going to advantage one party at the expense of another? That's the equitable piece for me. So am I unfairly advantaging or disadvantaging one party or the other with process or location or time of day or day of week. All of those things, they're a close cousin. That's all stuff I think about. What if you believe parties are about to strike a deal that would be egregiously unequitable to one side? I can't substitute for another party's judgment. I can help them understand 
what the world will look like if both parties make an agreement, understanding what things mean. That's absolutely fair territory for me. I can't tell you that a deal isn't good for you. And that can cause emotion for the mediator. I'll tell you that right now. Because I have seen parties knowingly, knowingly agree to something that was not in their best interest because there wasn't many other options. There really were no other options. And that can be very sad. If you think about industries that are disappearing and you have skills that don't translate easily, those can be difficult in the collective bargaining arena. Is there a particularly memorable negotiation in which you facilitated a resolution that makes you most proud? And how did you help to achieve that outcome? Sometimes it happens when an individual or a few individuals find that they have risen to a level that they didn't think they could get to or they didn't know existed. They emerged a better negotiator, communicator, more trusting. The little things are everything to me. There aren't many grand gestures of appreciation. And like, I've had a few standing ovations. That's really nice. But I can picture someone taking me aside and saying, I was wrong about that person. If you project two, three years down the road for those parties, for that relationship, and think of all of the things that are going to be different and the ripple effect that that small change in perception from person to person could have on the work, on the workers, on the environment. That's the stuff that I really need to focus on and that keeps me going. The minutia, the mud, those are the things that stick with me. And there are a few times that that has happened and it's incredibly rewarding. I've received letters of appreciation from tribal nations that I've worked with where an agreement has eluded them for a very long time. And I have one letter that 20 different tribal nations signed in appreciation for our mediation team. That kind of changes your world too. And that's maybe on a little bit of a grander scale. Are there emerging issues in labor relations today that you believe will significantly impact the work of FMCS mediators going forward? It takes something extreme to change what our work looks like with the parties. Trends, big decisions, and things like that. Our work looks the same. It will largely look the same from case to case, party to party. The thing that I think changed everything for us, and it's still changing everything, is what we're doing right now. The virtual environment that we are now in. This is the new normal, and in six months, we're going to see even greater change than the previous six months or year because technology moves so quickly. At the outset of the pandemic, we didn't miss a beat. We transitioned seamlessly to 100% virtual service delivery. And the last year or so that we've seen somewhat of a transition back to in-person work, um, we will never go back to where we were before COVID-19 changed everything. We just won't. We've proven that mediation and everything else we provide can be as effective, as useful, sometimes more so than in person. Understanding that we lose some things and that it's very different and that you really have to approach some things in a different way. But that's the thing that, that is going to be the biggest change in, in mediation, for sure, in our lifetime. Could you talk a little bit about the differences between a negotiation done virtually and one that's in the room? The obvious first difference is that you can be absolutely anywhere in the world. We haven't yet done one where a participant is in outer space, but I'm sure that's coming. Time zones are all of a sudden a factor that you have to include. As far as the mediator experience goes, there is a heftier preparation for bargaining in terms of all of the participants, sometimes one-on-one -on -one or separately. You've got to get the technology right to incorporate time zones. You've got joint session where everyone's videos are on the screen. You've still got private caucus because we have breakout rooms. 
certain things are interesting to navigate, like sidebar conversations that used to happen either planned or unplanned. They are very seldom unplanned nowadays when we are working virtually because you have to ask for one. Someone might send me a private chat or I might send them a private chat. Hey, can I meet you in breakout room C? There's a lot of things that have popped up, especially in multi-party negotiations. Two parties will want to caucus together without the other parties and they'll message me saying they want to do that. That, of course, could happen in person, but it becomes something slightly different when they have to ask the mediator for it and I have to create space for them virtually. That might create the need for me to let all the other parties know that this is now being built into the process of, of the mediation because it's now a planned thing and a lot of the multi-party processes we do in full sunlight. So that's an interesting dynamic. The personal connection component has been a topic of conversation. You have a lot of folks who think that you just can't get the same sense of a person if we're looking at each other on the screen. We can't connect as well. And I think there are times when that is true. I also think there are exceptions to that. It just takes work. Momentum is a thing, too. We can be across the world in the same room at the same time, and negotiations can conclude. If we had been in person, people have to get on the airplane, they have to go away, and then it might be months before we can get together again. We can get together the next day if we need to keep the momentum going. So ad hoc and unplanned meetings can occur really, really easily. Sometimes that makes for good momentum, and sometimes that allows parties to stall a little bit. And we don't have to make progress at this session because we could just have a session tomorrow, couldn't we? And so people forgetting to come to meetings or, oh, I'm sorry, something popped up on my schedule. Let's schedule it for next week. You can imagine it really depends on how willing the parties are to make negotiations a priority in the virtual environment. That doesn't even brush the surface of all the factors and, and the nuances that go into virtual versus in-person. Moira, how did you come to be a mediator? Are there events in your life which conditioned you for this profession? That's a good question. Well, the easier one is how did I come to be a mediator? I started off in labor and employee relations. I'm a career fed. I've always been a federal government employee. When I worked for the Navy, we worked with federal sector labor unions in administration of CBAs. I also worked on the employee relations side of the house. And I'm really grateful that I did because that's all a negotiation, too. I felt like I was a mediator sometimes as an employee relations specialist. Certainly problem solver and somewhat of a consultant, I would say. I came to mediation because at one point I had cause to work with a mediator in my own collective bargaining dispute. And at the conclusion of that mediated process, the mediator asked me how I liked my job and if I would consider becoming an impartial third party because he thought that I had a lot to offer. And at that point, FMCS wasn't even really on my radar. I threw my hat in the ring. And when the time came, when the vacancy was opened, I was called for an interview. And a few months later, I had a new job. <laughs> I studied communication in school because I wanted the broadest absolute thing possible. I never wanted to decide what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wanted to keep my options as open as possible and go out and explore the world. I think that was the decision that kind of set me on the path. I just thought it was really cool to go from hostage negotiations communication class to health communication, like public communication, to organizational communication. And I was a kid in a candy store. I've used every single one of those skills and subject matter in my work. And if you think about it, we are always negotiating. We are always trying to get closer to people who don't think the way we do. We have to work with people everywhere in everything that we do. So I think it was when I just woke up and realized that everything was preparing me for this job and allowing it all to teach me and mold me into the professional that I wanted to be. And you were the first woman hired by the Boston FMCS office. 
as a mediator. I was. And how was that experience? It was interesting. I would be lying if I said it wasn't a little intimidating at first. I knew that there were industries that we serviced in the greater Boston area that made it clear they would benefit from FMCS hiring a female mediator because that's how a lot of their membership looked. A lot of their membership was female and there was a component of being able to empathize and connect. But those aren't the only industries that I worked with. There were still a lot of places, rooms that I walked into where I was the only female. Sometimes it made a difference and sometimes it didn't. When I look back on all of that, some of it was in my head. I knew that I was the first female. And with that comes a certain weight, a certain heaviness, like I'm carrying the torch. I never thought, what, early 2000s that I would be a female torch carrier. But some of it was not in my head. And I wouldn't say it was even on purpose. I would just say if you're used to working with nothing but males and being able to tell jokes a certain way or use certain language or whatever. So my strategy was to simply be a person that you could say pretty much anything around and really stretch myself to give myself the space and the permission to be different in places where it wasn't expected and to have that actually add value and not just have it be something that we have to deal with. Over the years, has the need to stretch been diminished over time? In other words, are we in a different arena relative to gender? I think there are still challenges. There are absolutely still challenges. I have seen differences, though. A lot more females in my profession and also at the bargaining table. You know, a few years in, in my first negotiation where I was at the head of the table, that's usually where the mediator sits, and the chief negotiator for the employer was female, and the chief negotiator for the union was female. And both of their second chairs, female. And this was not a profession that is all female. It's just the way that it was. And that's interesting. So that's one way that it's changed. And... Also, this work, this profession, is just by definition a kind of a small world. People get to know you. When you are a third-party neutral, if you're not an honest broker, you have no work. You just won't see the inside of a collective bargaining dispute if you're not authentic. So people get to know you, and they know what to expect, and that changes everything. Could you generalize enough to talk about the difference in discourse at a negotiation table with women dominating in numbers as opposed to men. It's interesting, Bob. I think there are probably more similarities than there are differences because with men, we all talk about things outside of work, where we're from, what our background is. Same with women. We joke, we laugh, we argue from time to time. We're unreasonable from time to time. That doesn't change depending on your gender at all, in my opinion. I think there are more similarities and differences. I'm not going to sit here and say that women are more creative, we're more understanding. I don't actually think that that's true. Of course, you've got some bravado and women can do that too. Really, we can. I don't think that there are that many differences. We all show emotion. It's an interesting question. The possible differences in which power is handled. There are more women in power positions, which we should have in the Senate, for instance. I remember a time when there were no women senators in the U.S. Senate. And that's the way I've been feeling too. We're just all people. I don't know that there's a masculine way of handling power or a feminine way of handling power. We all have different styles. It's really hard to characterize styles that we would typically think of as feminine and styles we would typically think of as masculine and not have that seem as if one is better than the other. A lot of the times I hear women qualify things that they say. I think it would be great if, uh, you know, l let me just throw out an idea. Maybe, maybe this won't work, but what I would say is sometimes... That puts a woman in a position to be talked over or to be talked down, to be ignored. And then sometimes that makes a woman less of a threat. So it's really up to you. 
earlier when you asked me if I speak differently with different people, there are rooms where I would not censor myself to have some of those qualifications in my own language because I feel more comfortable being heard in rooms and not as if I have to meet a certain expectation level for those that I'm working for. And there's some of that that is me being female as well as being intuitive, someone who senses what is needed. If you could talk with your 20-year-old self and give her advice, what would that be? Mm -hmm. The first thing that comes to mind is you're going to get there. So you can take it easy on yourself throughout the journey. And at the same time, I don't know where there is exactly. The timing that it takes you to become, to get better at what you're doing. I remember I was worried in the beginning of, of this job that no one would call me or no one would want me as their mediator because I didn't have that many mediations under my belt. Everyone starts somewhere. Anything that you're good at today, chances are one day you were bad at it. And I was worried that I wouldn't have a lot of work. That lasted for about three months. And since then, my phone just rings off the hook. I've just never had to worry about having work or being busy. And there are countless other worries I've had over the years they were just that. They were worries, and none of it ever came to fruition. Worrying, I think, is taxing to your nervous system. We can say that, but the worries still come. I would give that person a hug, and I would tell them, it's just you wait. Moira, it's been a lot of fun talking with you. I really appreciate your thoughts, and maybe we could do it again sometime and focus on some of the more narrow issues that we probably think could take up a whole segment. Anytime, Bob. It's really been fun for me, too. Thanks so much, and take good care. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Where the Twain Meet. And please check out future programming at our website, wherethetwainmeet.com. <laughs>